<laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How's everybody? Oh, God bless you all. It's so good to get together in the house of the Lord and be able to praise God with all of our hearts. Amen. Oh, and it is a privilege and honor to be able to share the word of God with the saints. So before we start, I'd like us to just close our eyes and uh, get in the presence of God. Thank you. Thank you, loving Father, for you're a good God. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to worship you in everything, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that every one of us belong to you. Everything we have belongs to you. All the gift that you've given us really belongs to you, Lord. Because without you, we have nothing to offer to you. We thank you, Lord, for your holy presence in this place. We thank you for the liberty you have given us to gather together to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful power of the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for your holy presence that is forever with us, going before us and being our rear guard. I want to thank you and acknowledge you, Lord, for even this place belongs to you. Everything that we are belongs to you. Let it be that our thoughts and our words give you honor due to you. We commit our hearts and this time to you as an offering and a sacrifice of praise. Let every heart, even as we are talking, Lord, be arrested by your presence. For in your presence there's fullness of joy. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace and there is joy. And there is liberty. Liberty, Lord. For you are the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the mighty one of Israel, the great and awesome God, the I am, the beginning and the end, the truth, the way, the life, the king of the whole universe, the precious, gentle lamb of God, the mighty lion of Judah, you are the great and awesome God who deserves all the glory and all is yours. Today we decree your awesome greatness and declare that your glory is the great and mighty presence given unto us that we may glorify you. Father, I pray that our hearts become fertile soil for the seeds of your word to bring forth trees of righteousness and fruits of righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. 
You are wonderful, God. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. Glorify yourself in their people, Lord. We give you glory. In the name of Jesus. And all the saints say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, I was asking the Lord what he wanted to say. <laughs> and uh, uh, we were in the refuge. We were in the land. And uh, I was not anxious or anything, but we were kind of busy. And so I said, Lord, you know, uh, what do you want to do on Saturday? How do you want to bless your people on Saturday? And uh, I just left it there, and suddenly I hear a voice saying, I want my people to hear about my presence. I said, oh, okay, okay. So I began to search the Word of God about the presence of God. So as I was preparing, there is this scripture that came to me, and it's in Hebrews 13, verse 8. And it says, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is always the same. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God is good. And God is good yesterday. And God is good today. And God is good tomorrow. You know that the scriptures brings to me the thought of the awesome greatness of God. He is omniscience. He's omniscient God. That means he knows all things. All. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. Everywhere. Even in the hidden, hot, highest and darkest places in the earth. He's there. And he's omnipotent God. He within has all power. So all power is within him and he contains all power. So, with this in mind, we can understand perhaps clearer that to God, yesterday is not behind Today is not in his face, and tomorrow is not later on. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all before his eyes. And that is why those that are called by God, those that have been gifted to prophesy, or those that have been given the gift to look in the past like he did to Moses. He showed him from the beginning up to the day of his life. And that contained five books written by the hand of Moses relaying all the revelation of what he saw in the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? So God took Moses to the past in the present and made him see the past in the present. In his present, he went to the past. He showed Abraham that the Israelites will be for 400 years imprisoned in Egypt. God took Abraham to the future. 
in his presence, in his presence, took him to the future and caused him to see the future. But while he was in his own present time, In Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 confirms this. He says, I can read this to you. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. He who is, sorry, he who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty God. I am reading from the Amplified Bible. I found it that for this was quite explicit, but in any Bible that you are looking at, it will say more or less the same because those some words are different. The context cannot change because it's the Word of God. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. And whatever is in the middle is the present. Amen. So, what does all this have to do with presence? You know, while I was preparing, I saw something that was quite amazing. I saw the similitude of the Lord God standing before like a, a, a long, um, you could say table, bench, whatever. And in this it was not really a table, but I, I, I don't know how to put words to it, so I say table. In it, there were people, animals, his creation, from one end to the other. Past, present, and future. And he's looking at it all at the same time. God, what is this? And he said to me, they are all before my presence. Oh, wow. So I put myself, may I? I put myself in that place and imagine looking at God. And right now, I am before his presence. And you are before his, before his presence. And you, whoever, wherever you are, you are before his presence. That is amazing. And that should shake everything within us that is not pleasurable to his presence. For there is nothing that can be hidden from God. And we're going to read this scripture. Nothing. He knows all things. Even behind closed doors. Even if everything looks nice and dandy, when we are in front of people, we close the door and we, are, we behave like lions. He knows that. He knows everything. Even when we don't want anybody to see what we're about to do or about to say, he already knows it. I'm sure there might be many questions you're asking yourself right now, but let us look at God's presence with Adam. In Genesis 2 verse 19, and out of the ground the Lord God formed 
every wild beast and living creature of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam. Okay. God made all these creatures and he brought them all before Adam. Adam was before God's presence. But God's presence was also before Adam. And he brought all this creation before Adam. What a relationship. How close. This was not something imaginary. This was a face-to-face. Why do I say face to face? Because in the, in the Hebrew word, the word presence does not exist as far as I know. Please correct me if you're a Hebrew girl or a Hebrew boy that know the word presence. As far as I know, the word presence is face. That's why in the scripture says that we must seek the face of the Lord. I seek your face. I'm seeking your presence. Because neither to God nor to us it should be enough the feeling of a presence. He wants us to see him face to face and he sees us face to face. In other words, he wants us to become the reflection of his countenance. He wants to look at us as a mirror where he sees his glory. Amen. So he brought that all the creatures and to see what he will call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. Wow, what a deep friendship. If that happened with Adam. And God brought back to us after the sin of Adam, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, the pure manifestation of the living God, the living expression of God who is love, That means to say that through Christ Jesus, God is giving us the entrance to a relationship of face to face. In Genesis 3, the next chapter, verse 8, he says this, And they heard the sound of the Lord God, this is Adam and Eve, walking in the garden like he used to come, in the cool of the day to visit them. Uh, I'm just adding up my own. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. In other words, they used to have wonderful times together. And at this time, it's proving that they hid from the presence of God. That means that they had always the presence of God until they sinned and realized that they were naked from the glory garments of his presence. Ha. They are dressing was the dressing of the glory of God as a garment around them that was like light and life beaming out of them that felt attraction to the presence of God, to the face of God. It was like, a, how could I say, like the same thing in them as if it was on God and the same thing in God in them. In other words, they merged together, they infused together when they fellowship because their garment was the garment of life and glory. And God is glory. So, when they sin, it's as if that garment fell off. 
and they found themselves naked without God's covering. And we know that when we are walking under the covering of the presence of God, we are not naked. There's no time to cite all the scriptures, but there are so many scriptures in the word of God that speak of the nakedness of sinful nature, nakedness of sin. But when we live a life of continuous fellowship with him, though we may fall into something, repentance, immediate repentance in the presence of God brings forth the continuous Continuity of friendship and does not allow the garment to fall off. So we are not naked before God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit shows us what is right from what is wrong. And in the moment we notice that we have fallen into some trap or we have done or said something that is not pleasing to God, we immediately acknowledge because we are before his presence. Nothing can be hidden from God. So the moment we messed up, <laughs> we immediately presented before God because we are there. He sees, he knows. So we said, oh, sorry, messed up. Forgive me, Lord. And like Pastor Jose earlier on, help me so I don't repeat and repeat this thing because it has to be from the heart. We can be saying sorry to the cows come home. That's an expression. But not truly meaning it. But if we truly mean it, I don't want this. I realize how it wounds your heart, breaks your heart, dear Lord, because, because you love me and I'm messing around with your love. Forgive me, I don't want to do this. Help me. That's all we need to do. You know, repentance is an act of worship too. Okay, with Abraham... Genesis 17, verse 1. His presence was also with Abraham. Verse 1. When Abraham, Abraham, Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. What does he say? The Lord appeared to him. If he appeared, that means to say his presence was very evident and obvious. And he said, so he spoke from his presence, I am the Almighty God. Walk and live habitually before me. Yeah. And be perfect, blameless, wholehearted, and complete. So here we have the instructions God gave to Abraham. To Abraham, before he became Abraham. He appeared to him and said, Walk and live habitually before me. So he's teaching Abraham what is all about walking with God. Because Abraham did not have a Christian background. He had a pagan background. So God is teaching Abraham. This is how you go about it. Here I am. I'm your God. I appear to you. Now I am your God. Make sure you walk with me or before me. And make sure you live habitually before me. And be perfect. The easiest way to become perfect is living habitually conscious that we are before God. Why? 
will dare not do anything that is offensive to him because he can see. Will dare not say something that we shouldn't because he can hear. In other words, it's the easiest way to walk a holy life. We agree? So, if anything, I like the people of God that are serious with God, just like you are, like you are, to become continuously aware of God's presence and that we are in his presence. So if we are about to blow the top, remember he's watching. If you're about to say a lie, remember he knows it. And a little lie, no matter how little or big, it's a lie. And that lie <coughs> will open the door for the devil to make it worse and make you habitually liar. Don't save face in an instance and lose face before God for good. Wow, that's a strong word, isn't it? Lord, <laughs> praise the Lord. Now, God was, his presence was with the Israelites as well. In Exodus 13, verse 21 to 22, it says this, The Lord went before them. By day, in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. Verse 22, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart before the people. Here explains why God used this. But while I was reading this and I read it again and again, I felt compelled to read it more and more. I realized that, you know what? The Egyptians were after them. When God made his presence like a cloud all around the Egyptians, the Egyptians, oh, sorry, around the Israelites, I beg your pardon, the Israelites could see each other. The Israel could move in that cloud. But the enemy, the outsiders, could only see a thick cloud and could not approach the enemy could not get through it because they could not see where they were going. That's, I saw that. And the fire, I imagine a wall of fire. Who will dare go with their horses and chariots and soldiers across that fire? That fire kept the enemy out by night. So the Israelites could rest in the night in the presence of God. Protection of God. Isn't that wonderful? How does it look? How does it look, that cloud? Have anybody seen that cloud personally? Well, I saw the fog... Has anybody seen the fog? Well, in this season, you know, wintery time, you know, it's, there's more rain in our area, so you find that in the morning there can be like a thick cloud. And sometimes we are driving with Pastor Jose on returning to Sydney, and the cloud is so thick, thick that you cannot see 30 meters. And you feel a little bit uneasy because you don't know whether you have a ditch next to you, a track coming up. You don't know what's going on in the other side of the cloud. So
So it makes you feel very insecure. And I believe the enemy felt just like that when the cloud of God's glory was covered in Israel while Israel inside the cloud could see. That is why I thought so many of us want to see the cloud of God, want to see the glory coming and all that. And we could be completely covered with the glory, but we don't see it because we are inside the glory. But the outsiders can see something because they are not in that glory. Can you see that? So that opened my eyes regarding my understanding of the glory that is coming. Because it is coming. And that glory is the presence of God. So it's not an item or a gift or something separated from God. It's God himself coming down. Huh? I, I get excited about it. It's, 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 it's not just a thing. It's him. Huh? Okay, uh, that presence of God was also with David. And David had, because he was with the sheep, right? And he spent days and nights, cold and hot, in the wilderness with the sheep, protecting the sheep. So he looked at the stars, and he looked at the firmament, and he begins to gaze the presence of God. In Acts 2, verse 25, it says this, For David says in regard to him, him who? The Lord. I saw the Lord constantly before me. I tell you, this is a complete, for anybody that will grab this, this is an amazing revelation. He was there all the time, I read it many, many times. But this time, it did something inside of me. Because he brought to me the question, Lord, am I consciously and constantly Having you before me, uh-uh. Sometimes I get so busy cooking, you know, I forget his presence. But this is what kept David with sanity, considering what he went through. And he continues saying, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken or overthrown or cast down from my secure and happy state. I do remember God telling me about this presence through one of the Psalms of David that says, the Lord is at my right hand side. And I took it and I said, really? Even if I don't quite see you all the time, you are on my right hand side. So he is before me. He's on my right hand side. And the Bible tells me that he goes behind me. So in other words, he is the glory cloud. Ha. Huh. And I remember at that time, he said, so I said, okay, Lord, if in any occasion I'm being asked a question, a tricky question that I don't know how to answer. Can I give you an elbow? And then you just tell me what, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, why not? He could say yay or nay, right? So one day I was in the church and somebody, I think it was being a bit of a smart aleck, and brought a real um, difficult question to me. And I'm not surprised because the Pharisees gave difficult questions to the Lord Jesus to say whether they, to see whether they could catch him. So, you know, it's not surprising that somebody might do that to you. Okay? So be prepared. Somebody somewhere might do that. They might not 
mean evil, but the one that is kind of moving them. Maybe. So the question came in and I was caught without knowing what to say. So I remember he's on my right hand side, so I went, <coughs> and they're watching me, you know, and I'm like, <coughs> Lord, what, what are you saying? And I'm, you know, like, like thinking, you know, but I'm actually talking to God and say, what are you saying, Lord? And the Lord told me what to say. So I lift up my face and I look at their eyes and I answer. And they were speechless. And I said, you are number one. From now on, this is with this partnership. <laughs> because I don't know what to answer, but you do. You're so good. Isn't he? The Lord told his people, make sure you walk before me and you live before me. Huh? So that is the best possible way. Now, not only David is before the Lord and keeps the Lord's presence before him, looking at him. Yeah, some people will say, yeah, how do I look at him if I don't see him? Makes sense, right? Yeah, if you're asking yourself that question, don't worry. Whether you see him or not, just keep him there. The moment you begin to connect with the revelation that God is before you in no time at all, you will see him. Because your connection will bring activation. Remember Bruce Allen, Dr. Bruce Allen's teaching? Well, it's quite effective. Think of God always in front of you. That will keep us walking in righteousness and truth. Want it. Now, David also talks to the Lord. In Psalm 28 of the same chapter, he says, You have made known to me the way of life. Uh -huh. You will enrapture me, diffusing my soul with joy. With and in your presence. With your presence and in your presence. Huh? I, I, I want to encourage you. Please take note. This is an amazing scripture. And meditate on it. Don't let the word of God pass by. And tomorrow we don't remember. Study it. Meditate on it. You have made known to me the way of life. Wow! There's so much to meditate on that. Jesus is the life. <laughs> you have made Jesus known unto me. That's one. You will enrapture me with and in your presence. Enrapture me before, on my side, and behind me. In other words, enrapture me. Completely cover me with your presence. What is the presence? The glory. What is the glory? The cloud. Are we getting ready for this end time? Are we, are we getting ready to what God is about to do? This is what God is about to do. First of all, we need to prepare our consciousness of who he is. What he is about to do. If we are not preparing our mind and our heart to understand what he's all about. What it was and is and is to come. We won't be ready for it. He wants us to be ready. <laughs> he doesn't want anybody, nobody to miss out. Amen. He's a good God. And Psalm 51, verse 10 and 12. Oh, we recite this scripture with Matthew and my grandchildren. Every, almost every night I get a chance. And he says, create in me a 
clean heart and renew the right spirit, not the wrong, the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. <laughs> David, before Jesus was born, Jesus was revealed to David. Jesus manifests himself to David. God the Father showed himself. And he so desperately in love with God. So marvelously wrapped with the glory and the presence of God that keeps him in peace in the midst of a king wanted to kill him at any cost. And the battles and the gruesome things of a battle cast me not away from your presence. I, I got the funny feeling that David, like everybody else, made some wrong decisions, wrong moves that caused his conscience to realize that he was jeopardizing that holy presence of God and he's begging, don't, don't take your presence away. In other psalm, he says, forget my sin. But you see, David has become such a friend of God. God was not in the business of making David disappear. He will have him repent, not disappear, because then, you know, he's such a good friend. He felt the pure love of David. And he says, and take not, listen to this, take not your Holy Spirit from me. What? We Pentecostals think that the Holy Spirit is only in our time. Ah, no. Because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God. And he was and he is, and he is to come. So David not only had fellowship with the presence of God, the glory cloud of God, but also with the Holy Spirit of God. No wonder he's so desperate saying, don't take it away. That's the kind of prayer we should pray when we messed up. Which we all can. If David was continuously before the manifest presence of God, and he always before the Lord, and he had Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. How much more is available to us now and in the days to come? I'd like us to meditate on this. How much more? I'd like us to from this day forward to begin to walk conscious of the presence of God. Live consciously, habitually in the presence of God. Now the Lord Jesus also manifested himself. Not only in the flesh, when he was born in the flesh, so he could have a flesh to hang in the cross for us. That's why God the Father gave him a body so he 
when he says, thank you, Father. He was thanking him for the body that was given to him, that he could hang it in the cross for us and return to the glory that he had with the Father in heaven. And that we may be partakers of that glory on earth and in heaven. Huh. What amazing. Now, I, I would really want to stress a point at this point. You know, there's so much out there being taught in YouTube. And some of those things are really good. Word of God is good. But some of those things have subtle darkness that if we have not expanded our lives before God, it can take away many of the wonderful promises that God has for us because of our ignorance. I want to warn you. What would we want to wear? Just think of this. If I could give everybody a choice, or if the choice was given me, to wear a, a second-hand garment that was worn by somebody else, and a brand new garment, what would you choose? Brand new, I would as well. No matter how pretty the second-hand Garment, no matter what brand, the fantastic brand it was, I'd rather even a humble garment that was never used by someone else. Because it will not carry somebody else's something or spirit or whatever else. This is brand new. And likewise in the things of God, wouldn't you rather spend your time in the presence of the living God inquiring of him? Having first class, brand new manna to eat than a second hand revelation? Don't take me wrong. There are amazing, mighty prophets and prophetesses of God that do speak from God's mouth. But we need to discern who they are. If they don't show fruits of righteousness, don't follow. And in YouTube, how would you know what the fruits are? How would you know the life of somebody in YouTube? I'm sorry. I need to say this because I'm going to tell you right now why is the reason it was posted in an app to which I have personal access. A video clip, oh, people love posting, you know. I watch this, and I want everybody else to know what I watched. Nothing wrong with that. But I've seen sometimes two, three different people posting the same thing in the same app. Hello, haven't you seen before what was in that app? You know, it's just... Not on, guys. I'm sorry. You still love me. But let me tell you what it was. God said to me, I, I don't watch uh, the videos unless the Lord says, watch that. Watch that. Otherwise, I will spend all the time that I, I'm supposed to be having a wonderful time with God, seeing a 3D dimension, 3, di three whatever dimension, wonderful vision of heaven or being taken to 
that three dimensional yeah, place. Because I'm using the YouTube thing. Look, you know, everybody has a choice and everybody has the right to choose. I choose the real thing. And I'd rather put the time there. And I know that if I'm watching the real thing, my husband will make sure that I don't get a knock on that door or anybody disturbing me. Because he knows that I'm not in YouTube. So, this is what happened. The Lord says, I want you to watch that video. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> since you say. And I start watching, I said, well, maybe God wants to bless me because this person is really using the word of God and it's nice, mm, interesting, mm, and I start chewing, mm, mm, nice, yeah, good, 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 until suddenly, fast and suddenly, this person rises up and says, for those that say that they have seen the Lord Jesus, they lie. Don't believe them. They are false prophets. I say, oh, hello. That's not the spirit of the living God talking there. Don't you see? The devil will use an innocent person that has a door opening somewhere. To say I'm on the truth, some lie that will grab the mind or the heart of another person. So I said, oops, Lord, this is not the right spirit. Uh-huh. I said, you wanted me to see this? Yes. What is the purpose of me seeing this? He says, you can discern. You have grown to the point of discerning. Okay. And I'm thinking, discerning what? <laughs> What what is it that the, you know? I could be discerning, but what what is that you're saying? So the Lord patiently and lovingly showed me. Look, Stella. That person is talking from the viewpoint of somebody that never saw me, and has to defend a position of authority, saying whoever sees me is false because that covers that person. And a lot of people done that. When I was seeking for the Holy Spirit, I was told that the Holy Spirit was not for now. The Holy Spirit had passed away. The Holy Spirit was, other people would say that it's demonic and all that. Everybody's got the right to say whatever they want to say. No judgment from my side. The word of God judges, not me. Who am I? All the boo-boos I've made in my life, you know, I'm worse than all. But God is trying to show me. He says, for those that can discern because they have seen me. And they know that it cannot be taken away from you. If you saw Jesus, who can take away the fact that you did? Huh? Jesus exists. And if people don't believe it, he still exists, right? And Abba is my father. And even nobody else believes it, he still is, right? And God showed himself to me and many of us and many of you. And who can take that away? So there is no need for judging anybody. But it's a need of caution. Because what about the wonderful people? And this is the point God gave me. The wonderful people that they are coming into maturity and being brought to the place where they can actually now see, just bow to the place. They are seeking God. I want to see you. I want to hear you, Lord. I, 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 can't, I, I, I cannot live without Lord. And God is hewning that person. And God is maturing that person until they can see God face to face. But what if they are in that predicament that they are seeking God and then suddenly they said, Oh, well, I don't see God, so the other ones might be lying. And that person is bound by that lie 
and held prisoner. Prisoner in darkness. Why do I say that? That because I remember being in the Philippines and uh, ministering to some uh, wonderful orphans. And the place was packed and there was one seat left right in the front. And uh, I see the doors open and I see Brother Sadhu coming in. Of course he was not there. But he comes in and I, I look at Brother Sadhu, but inside I know it's God. What? It's God, God, Jesus is coming, but he looks like Brother Sadhu. He walks like Brother Sadhu. He's dressed like Brother Sadhu. And he come and sit there in the only empty seat. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what is going on. Lord Jesus is you, but is Sadhu. What? I, I don't understand these things of the Spirit. So when I came back and eventually met with Brother Sadhu, I said, Were you in the Philippines at such and such a time? He looks at me. He knows better than that. He doesn't answer. He says, why? <laughs> Clever. So I told him, why? I said, why, knowing that it's Jesus, I see you. And he said this, look, Stella, you probably not yet mature to see Jesus the way he really is. So until then, he shows himself in the countenance of somebody that you respect Highly in the spirit realm. And I went, oh, okay. It wasn't you after all. It was Jesus anyway. And I know now I have this nugget of truth in my heart. And I can go to say, Jesus, mature me. Lord Jesus, okay, I rest now knowing that you're still working inside of me. It's not that I am not good. It's not that I'm not worthy because you may, I am not good and not worthy, but you make me worthy and you are working inside of me to will to do what is your good pleasure, to see your fellowship with you and to know that you are before me and I am before you. And one of these days, I'm going to see you because you're working in me. And you're perfecting in me. So then the hope, the hope of his glory gripped my heart. And I lost, lost no hope. I was not anxious anymore wanting to see God. Because I know I knew God was, had me already in the pathway. God already was working. But what about those that did not have that revelation? What about them that they are seeking God's face and they are saying, I want to see you. And they hear something like that preaching. Sisters, brothers, deception is coming like a flood. Not just a flood, coming like a tsunami. And we must be ready. I want to encourage you to seek God. And if he tells you to watch something in YouTube, then watch it. If not, get on your knees. Worship God until his presence is more evident. Read the word of God until something comes to your heart. And if he does, follow it. Obey it. Let that word work in your heart until it becomes life. Amen. The Lord Jesus appeared after his resurrection in spite of what anyone else said. <laughs> it's in Mark. Read the Bible. It's in Mark 16, 14. 
I got to read it too, you know. So I'm not saying like, I don't want to say it in a facetious way. I also need to read the Bible more and more each day and get revelations. In Mark 16, 14 says, afterwards, after having been resurrected, he appeared to the 11 apostles as they reclined at the table and he reproved them and reproached them for their unbelief. Their lack of faith and their hardness of heart sometimes is nothing else but the heart having been hardened with unforgiveness, with unbelief and the things of this world. Hardness of heart because they had refused to believe those who had seen him and looked at him attentively after after, after he has risen. Let this word set everyone free who has heard such teaching as that God does not appear. Well, the word of God says he has. And if he did after being risen from the dead, to the apostles and to many saints, he can do it to us. Is that right? He appeared to Paul way after and said, why do you persecute me? Mm -hmm. His presence was with the believers that were evangelizing. In Acts 11 verse 20, 21. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on returning to Antioch spoke to the Greek also, proclaiming to them the good news, the gospel about the Lord Jesus Christ. They were evangelizing. Just as they did then about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation, Many will rise up in these last days and speak of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. And the pre verse 21, and the presence of the Lord was with them, with power, so that a great number learned to believe, to adhere to, to trust and rely on the Lord and turned and surrendered themselves to him, Jesus. So it was the presence of God with them, before them, beside them, behind them, with them, with them. And the power of that presence was the one that convicted the people that heard the word coming out of the mouth of the believers. And caused, that word caused their hearts to turn and to give themselves to Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to speak a little bit if there is enough time, of his glorious presence. Because that presence is going to become far more evident and work far deeper in the hearts of people. And the name of this presence is commonly called Shekinah Glory. Romans 9, verse 4. For the Israelites, for the Israelites, and to them belong God's adoption as a nation and the glorious presence, the Shekinah. Shekinah. Amen? We'll just use that bit. So, in the time of the Israelite, that cloud was the Shekinah glory of God. 
Sounds okay? We all agree? That is the Shekinah glory that is coming down. That will cause our enemies to be kept away. Until such, such time that Aisha turned either to be um, martyred or whatever else God has planned for us. But until such time, God's Shekinah glory will preserve us. But brothers and sisters, I want you to realize that when the Shekinah glory comes, we may be able to see it coming over the people. But you might not see it having come upon you. Yet you feel the power, you feel the fire, you feel the presence, you feel the heat, you feel everything. We do not live by feelings, however. We live by faith. So don't major in feelings, which is what we want to major on. Major in faith. And minor in feelings. Don't, I got to feel. Don't, don't consider, I got to feel it. I got to feel this, I got to feel that, I got to. Don't. Just believe. When the apostles asked Jesus, what must we do? He said, just believe. Simple, isn't it? Just believe. So the end time cloud and pillars, presence of God. We read about God's presence with the Israelites in the olden days. We are being encouraged to expect that even in the last days, the presence of God will go before us, behind us, Beneath us, above us, because the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice was made for us to become carriers. Carriers, say carriers. Carriers of his glory. Chariots of fire. Carriers. So we don't need to go looking for the glory. Where is the glory? Ah, oh, that, that ministry has the glory. Oh, they go there. Oh, that church. Oh, uh, the glory showed up there. Oh, let's all run there. Oh, the glory went into uh, Massachusetts. Let's check. Oh, no, but we cannot fly now, can we? Wherever we go. We carry the glory. Let us be aware that the glory of God is in the last days upon the true believers. Not that the other ones are not true believers, but to the true surrendered believers. Where there's nothing else that God has to deal with because it Presence of God. Thank you, Maris. Stay there, don't watch me. There's far better sight in the presence of God. Don't watch me. Close your eyes. Now, don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. Please. If we cannot obey such a tiny little encouragement, how can we obey God? Just keep your eyes closed for your benefit. For your benefit. And stay still. 
and know that he is God. And he is before you and you are before him. See yourself. Whichever way you want to see yourself, little, grown up, whatever, in front of God, because that is scriptural. I am before you, Lord. Do it at home. Just stay quiet. Each member of the family that is watching this, just stay still and know that he is God. And see yourself before the Lord. And do this habitually. Start every five minutes. See yourself before the Lord. If you need to put an alarm clock in your wrist every five minutes, stand before the Lord just for us to become habitually acquainted with his presence. This is the preparation for us to walk in the glory. Because when we are before the Lord, there will not be sin that is not seen And the goodness of God will lead us to speak, to confess or repent, to exalt, whatever the Lord's Holy Spirit leads us to. Some of you are experiencing right now something different in your heart. It's as if there was a door closed and it's beginning to open. This is the door of fellowship. And it is as if there is a warm breath going in and out from that door of the heart to God and from God, backwards and forwards. Some of you are experiencing that. But God is an special, wonderful, personal God that will cause you to experience the manifestation of the living Father, the manifestation of the living God on a personal way. Thank you. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Just to finish, let us come back now. Without abandoning the presence of God, we're still in the presence of God, but there's one more scripture that the Lord wants to pull through. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, it says this, For I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that our forefathers were all under and protected by the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and every one of them passed safely through the Red Sea. Verse 2, 
And each one of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were thus brought under obligation to the law, to Moses, and to the covenant consecrated and set apart to the service of God. That's how it was then. Verse 3, and all of them ate the same, listen to this, a spiritual, supernaturally given food. Called what? Mana. All of them ate manna. And what the word of God says that is a spiritual food. Though they ate it with the mouth, it's a spiritual food and supernaturally given by God because it rained down every morning, right? Before we go to verse 4, I want to remind us of the word in John 6, 51 that says Jesus is the manna for the end time believers. Uh -huh. have, you, have you eaten manna lately? You have? How wonderful. Okay, I would like to hear that testimony when we finish. That's wonderful. Is it common? To be eating manna nowadays? Physical manna, is it? Is it? No response. It must not be. But, yes it is. There you go. Eh? There is a witness. So, the manna from heaven is given supernaturally to the Israelites. And that's what they ate. Because they had nothing else. Likewise, in the end time, there is a great possibility that we might not be able to acquire food. By which God again will feed us with manna. But this time, let us make sure we don't complain like they did. Amen. So let us learn how to discipline our body and taste buds. Amen. So going back to verse 4 in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, it says, And they drank the same spiritual supernatural given drink. Uh -huh. For they drank from a spiritual rock, we know what Moses did, which followed them. The rock followed them? Huh? Produced by the sole power of God himself without natural instrumentality. And the rock was Christ Jesus. At that time, Jesus had not yet come in the flesh, yet he was their rock. He followed them. Ah. Through him, we have access to God's presence in heaven and in earth. Looking for heaven's perspective when we are taken in heaven. Amen? Because, this is what I saw when I was preparing this. I saw myself as a little person looking at the big God, right? I'm looking. But then, I saw myself being picked up like a little child. Ah! And so, you know, the mothers, mothers know that they put the child on their hip because there's not too much weight to the shoulder. So they put the child in the hip, hip and the hold. Was I the only one that did that? Okay. So God did that. And he set me on his hip and held me. 
And he says, now look from my perspective. Oh, very different. Everything very different. Whatever mammoth demon, he looked like a little cat. Because I'm looking from God's sight. I'm looking from above. That doesn't make me a great believer. Just a little kid sitting on the lap, on the, on the hip of the Father, who by grace and mercy showed me that I was before him. And now I look from his side. And the scripture that came to me while I was experiencing that is, we are seated with Jesus, yeah, Christ, in places. We are seated with Jesus. Because of Jesus, we are seated in a place of authority. But it is not just an imaginary thing. It's a real thing. It, guys, it's a real thing. Don't believe about this. Being an imaginary thing is real. And it's for all of us. And he already paid the price for it. The ticket is already purchased. And it's way available. Because it's the scripture. We believe the scripture. We keep in touch with the scripture. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And then, that word. As we connect with it, it will cause things to happen. We will activate. Amen. Jesus says in John 6, 51, I myself am the living bread that comes down from heaven. I, in, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And also the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Amen. Now one question the Lord gave me. And I share with you what he said to me. You know, when we're talking about the rock being Jesus, that they drank from the rock. Amen. Now, who is our rock? Sure, that's what it is. But God is asking, look inside. Who is your rock, Stella? We know here, but here, is it our pastor? Is it the church? Is it the latest popular preacher? Is it our parent for the kids? Is it our youth leader? But the word of God says that anything that can be shaken will be shaken. So church, parent, leaders, they will all be shaken if they can be. But there is one that cannot be shaken. And that is the rock of our salvation. If we stand in the foundation of the rock of Christ Jesus, whatsoever God builds within us will not be shaken. What we build will be shaken. What he builds cannot be shaken. Because Jesus is the foundation for every believer. He is the verb. In Spanish, you know, you know the, 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 the verse 1 of chapter 1 of the book of John that says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the Spanish Bible, 
at least the one that I read, says, in the beginning was the verb. And the verb was with God, and the verb was God. And I thought, what's the difference between word and verb? Verb is active. But our understanding of word might not just be active. Might be an inactive thing. But word and verb are the same, and they are active. Energizing. We know this in Hebrews 4, 12, 13. It says this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. For the word of God speaks and is a life and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. And I wrote down there, it creates. Just for me to remember, that means the word of God creates whatever is spoken. So when we speak the truth, it creates truth and sets people free. When we speak lies, it creates lies and makes people bound. He says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. <coughs> so it cuts inside of us. Penetrates to divine, dividing line of the breath of life, which is the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrows of the deepest part of our nature. Exposing and sifting, analyzing, and judging the very thoughts and purposes of our heart. That's why some of us don't want to read the Word of God. Have you thought of that? Because when we read the Word of God, the Word of God will expose, it will judge our thoughts. Ah, that's not going to happen to you guys. You're all holy. Amen? But we've got to be careful the thoughts that we entertain in our mind. And we've got to be careful that we continuously expose ourselves to the light of the Word of God because it will create holiness. It will create righteousness. It will create Truth, it will create healing, it will create wisdom and every good thing described in the book. But we need to eat it, to digest it, so we get the nutrients of it, right? But if there is something wrong in our diet, a spiritual diet, it will judge it. It will analyze it. It will show it to us. It will expose it to ourselves. God is not in the business of exposing people unless they are so stubborn that will not allow themselves to be exposed before him. So, if we spend time before him and we approach the word of God saying, Lord, what are you saying today for me? Read such and such. What does this have to do with me? Start having a conversation with God and let him tell us what it's all about. I guarantee you in the name of the Most High God, the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth. If we seek it, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I'm talking from out there. But I'm encouraging my soul as well as everybody else's. But this next verse is an amazing verse. 
He worked wonders for me. And I will soon tell you how. Verse 13 says, And no creature exists that is concealed or hidden from his sight, the sight of God. But all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In, in, in another translation, it said, with him to whom we must give account. So in other words, there's nothing we can hide. Might as well be people of integrity and depth. There's nothing can be hidden from God. So we might as well be open to let the seven torches of the Spirit of God to shine in our hearts and the eyes of the torches to look deep in us and say, Lord, show me the hidden things that I do not know of and give me the grace to face them and get rid of them. Because the word of God is the truth. The truth sets us free. That's deliverance. That's deliverance, guys. That's the end time deliverance. Okay, there is a place for deliverance. There is a place for casting this and casting that. I do not deny that. But there's no better deliverance than deliverance of the word of God. Two Thessalonians, blah, 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 blah. sorry, two Thessalonians, chapter one, verse from five to ten, but we are going to read verse. I will read it all. This is positive proof of the just and right judgment of God to the end that you may be deemed deserving of His kingdom. He says. A plain token of his fair verdict with design that you should be made and counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for the sake of which you are also suffering. So suffering makes us worthy of the kingdom. Prepare us to become worthy of the kingdom. How many of us know that if everything is nice and dandy, we might not have sufficient depth to put up with the thought of end times? But when we suffer through life, it kind of makes us resilient, makes us stronger, not hard, stronger. And that this word says that makes us worthy of the kingdom. Verse 6, it is fair decision since it is a righteous thing which God to repay with distress and affliction those who distress and afflict you. So God does not close his eyes and play blind to the sufferings that you go through because of the word of God. Amen? We might suffer things because of what we do or choose not to do or whatever. But when we are persecuted and suffer for the sake of the word of God, God records it. Verse 7, and to recompense you who are so distressed and afflicted by granting you a relief and rest along with us, fellow sufferers, when the Lord Jesus Christ, when? When the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flames of fire. This is what's coming. Some people call them seraphims. Don't go looking for seraphims. 
look at the face of Jesus. He's going to come anyway. And the seraphims with him. To deal, verse 8, to deal out retribution, chastisement, vengeance upon those who do not know or perceive or become acquainted with God willfully and upon those who ignore and refuse to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know this scripture very well. I recommend we memorize it. Verse 9. Such people will pay the penalty and suffer the punishment of everlasting ruin, destruction and perdition and eternal exclusion and banishment from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Meditate on this. This compels me to think. If in any way I am part of the description or any part of me refuses anything. Because you know what? I don't want to end up there because I don't want to allow God to show me inside of me. I'd rather he show me inside of me than me try to avoid it and then find myself in troubles. And if by a hair I make it, will I be in the place I've always dreamed? But it says, when he comes to be glorified, that's why God is preparing his church, because he loves us so much and he's giving word after word after word of encouragement, so we allow him to prepare us. When he comes to be glorified in what? In his saints. What? He's coming to give be glorified. He fight not on himself in his saints, in you and you and me. Ha! Hallelujah. On that day, he will be made more glorious in his consecrated people. Consecrated. Let us say consecrated. He will be even more glorious. I mean, he's so glorious that he, he shines more than seven suns. How much more glorious will he be? But he will be made more glorious in his consecrated saints. Oh, I will meditate this day and night until he's done something. And he will be marveled at and admired in his glory reflected in all who have believed. His glory reflected in all who have believed. His glory reflected in all who have believed. So brothers and sisters, in view of all this, I will read verse 12 as a prayer over all of us. And this prayer was written by the saint, and he said, Thus may the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified and become more glorious through and in you. And may you also be glorified in him, according to the grace, the favor, and the blessing of our Lord of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. This is my prayer for all of us. That the presence of God will envelop us. That the seven lamps of the Spirit will be permitted by us to shine on our hearts 
and show us things we don't even know, but God wants to take away. And that God will grant us the grace to allow him to do the work and the completion of his presence in his saints, that he may be glorified in us and us in him, and that the whole world may know that he is God because he manifests in you and you and you and you and you and all of you and you and me. To him be the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And Pastor Jose wants the mic. So, bless you guys at home. Bless everybody. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Stella. Hallelujah. Okay, let's all be upstanding. Let's just close in the word of prayer. Remembering what we heard today. Guys, we, get, we need to bear fruits of righteousness in our life. Bear fruits of repentance. So whatever needs to come out, needs to come out in our lives. And I believe even now, we are, God is using His Word to set us free. You know, we go through a, a time of deliverance because the Lord, the Word sets us free. Time of healing because the Word heals us. Right? So I'll leave that all with you as you meditate on those words. I also want to ask people, if you have not been baptized before, make a, 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 call this, a decision you know, through the conscience that God is giving you to get baptized all right, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, and I tell you what, when you decide to get baptized, it's like a new page in your life. So for those who have not been baptized before, Come and see me and we will organize for you to be baptized. All right? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you show us marvelous things through your word. Thank you, Lord, for the word that's been spoken today by Pastor Stella. We pray, Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, that you will work in our hearts. And we ask also, Lord, that you will bless our tithes and offerings to you. That you will multiply those seeds, Lord, that has been given to you with a, with a loving heart, with a generous heart, with a thankful heart. Bless each one, Lord Father. And Lord, as we go through this week, we commit our lives to you. Lord, use us for your kingdom. Use us for your glory. That we can be a blessing to many. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go and serve the Lord. God bless you all.